the question today is whether your business should be in social media. And so before asking that question, I'd like to know um, how many people here are on Twitter and using Twitter? How many people have a blog? How many people are on Facebook? That would, I would figure that. LinkedIn? Okay. Quora? Okay. Um, so, so there's a lot of reasons that you should be on social media. But obviously there's some reasons that you shouldn't be. And I would like to, to address some of those at first and, and I would be welcome any of your thoughts as to why you're not. Um, and, and just so that I know, how many businesses are on social media right now? About half or more, that's great. Um, I'd say the first issue with social media and the reason that people don't pursue it is cost. Um, and that seems odd because social media is free, right? I mean, you can get a Twitter account and a Facebook account, you can set up a blog, you can do all of these things for free. Um, but I really think when you put all of the investment that it takes to successfully pull off social media, it actually is, is rather costly um, to build the strategy to man the, the resources that go into that. And so I think there, there is a good reason not to um, in cost. And we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit. Um, in some of these questions, I, I'm going to talk at the very end about a new social network called Quora. But I actually posed this question to a community of a lot of people that are on social media and asked them what they thought and the top reasons why not to participate. And so I'll say this and several of these other um, points came from Quora. And it's a great question and answer social network that's just now growing and there's all this speculation as to whether it's the next big thing or not. Whether that's true or not, it's, it has received this rapid growth in December, right around Christmas time. It's, it had the growth that Facebook had two years ago over Christmas. So um, anyway, our customers aren't on social media. And that's a pretty good reason not to participate. If, uh, if you're trying to reach and engage people that aren't already there, um, then there's little sense to do that other than to monitor those that are on there. Um, with medical and with um, securities, with regulated industries and the amount of information that you post online, um, those are two reasons that most people avoid participation. It's not to say that you cannot participate because of HIPAA or because of SEC, but it means that you have to be very careful about how you participate. And so the rules and the policies that you set up on the front end are very important. Um, and take quite a bit of time and planning on the front end before there's actually any participation. The, the other thing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the transition of the web and sort of where it is now, where it's come from, but the idea behind social media is that it's a conversation. It's an engagement. And if you're unwilling to actually engage with people, to talk with them, to learn about them, and you really talk to them, that's a great reason not to participate because that's just noise out in, in social media. Um, liability, there's several defama defamation cases going on. There's locally a defamation case going on right now where social network was used to defame a company and there's a, there's a lawsuit. So there's concern about liability in using um, social networks. And then finally, and I think this is really important as you plan to set it up, that you are entrusting your brand to the participant on the social network. If you have someone writing on Twitter on behalf of your company, they are your brand. They're your brand representative that are out there in the public. And you have turned over your history, your identity, your brand, your company to this person, and they're representing you. And there's some fear um, to actually enter into that. So, Gavin, do you have any other no's? No. All right. It's important to know your no's. Um, I'm going to just run through a, just a brief history. I think it's really important to set the stage of where we are in 2011. Um, the Internet, most people participated in the Internet for 15, 16 years, somewhere around there now. And 
remember back to the AOL days. Um, it was one of the first social networks that we had. Um, there was a community behind um, AOL. They had the AOL Instant Messenger. You could start to connect with one another on that and, and direct message and instant message back and forth. But the internet as a whole during the time in the, in the mid-90s, late-90s, was the uh, Web 1.0. It was a world where the publication was controlled by a few people. The, the geeks, the, the few people that knew how to actually write HTML, they were creating web pages, they were putting that content out there. And there were still this form of gatekeepers that were out there. And that was the original intent of the internet was not to have it controlled that way, but in reality it was. Not everyone was publishing content. So I, I did a few screen grabs of some very old pages. The old Yahoo page um, is very interesting. But the other thing that we had at this time were forums started to pop up. People started to ask questions and then you, know, you might start a thread and ask a question about a particular topic. And a lot of people would chime in with their own responses to that. And we had list serves at the same time. Those are the very roots that social media is built on. And so we've got the, the instant messenger here. The idea is what happened as technologies evolved, as it became easier to create land into what they called Web 2.0. And that, a lot of people call that different things. Really the point for me is that's when the, it shifted to where content creators became everyone as opposed to the 1% of the population on the internet producing content. Now it was the 99% that were, that were able to and had the ability to produce content. And so we have all of these networks that are built out of that. And we, you know, we're gonna go through every one of these. Um, and Gavin's gonna explain every one today. So we're actually going to 8.30. No. But if we organize all of, all of those different networks out there, we find that we have lots of organization into um, different channels that are, that are in this social web that we, we now have. <clears throat> and so you might look up there and see some things that you recognize. Um, Flickr is a great picture sharing site that we'll talk a little bit about. Really one of the first social sites to build this community behind photographs and photographers that were able to share their photographs and get comments and share settings on the cameras that they're using. Um, we have blogs up here. We have several different blog platforms up there. Um, and a lot of these that we'll, we'll dig into. But we built all of these channels that people could now communicate and share their ideas. So the, uh, that brings us to the topic. I, I'm long-winded and I have a long introduction, but that gets us to the point as to whether we should use business, uh, have business uses for social media. And what I did, I tried to think about this differently as I was putting this presentation together and to say, uh, how is the best way to approach it? And I went sort of with the journalist approach, the, the who, the what, and so I've got six questions that we'll ask and kind of go down deeper into that. But I think the very first question that you have to ask when thinking about engaging in social media is, what are your goals? What do you seek to accomplish out of this engagement? Um, it's going to be an investment of time. It's going to be an investment of money. So are you seeking to build customers up? Um, and so I'm going to tell a little story about one possible use, which is customer service. Um, I don't know, does anybody recognize this picture? Has anybody seen this before? Um, is everybody familiar with Comcast? Um, the, um, the company had a problem in 2003 because they had really long hold times on their technical support. You'd call into Comcast, you'd be put on hold for 15 minutes, you would find out that that person couldn't actually answer your, your problem and they would transfer you to someone else. And so that was what they were known for. So in New York City, this guy calls and has a Comcast technical support person come out to his house. And so this picture right here is a YouTube video that was posted in 2003 of a technician that fell asleep on this guy's couch while he was on hold with Comcast technical support. 
they posted it to YouTube, and within two days, there were two million views on this video. And this, when you Googled Comcast, was the number one result. <laughs> Terrible customer service. So in 2006, 2007, um, what's the guy's name, Comcast Cares? Uh, Frank Ellis. Frank Ellis? Frank Ellison. Frank Ellison, we'll say, um, got onto Twitter and formed a handle called Comcast Cares. And with this handle, he, would, he had a search across all of Twitter, and he was looking for people complaining about Comcast. So you would get on there and say, I can't stand the whole times on Comcast, and Frank would reach out to you with this Comcast Cares Twitter account and say, what's your problem? How can I help you? You know, give me your phone number. And that became his vision and goal, and all of the time that he spent in, in his customer service was on Twitter. He did not answer the phones anymore, and he became a superstar within Comcast. And he was given resources to have a team of, at first, five people, and it grew to 12 people, and I don't know how big their department is now. But if you ever have a problem with your cable, you can get on Twitter and write something about Comcast and how they're terrible or how your service is out. And within minutes, you will have someone reach out to you. And we've actually tested this. I've had friends that, will, that were on hold, and I told them to try a tweet. Um, and they, they were actually tweeted quicker and direct messaged quicker than the person an answered the phone. So one great use of, of social media is customer service and customer care. Um, you have any examples of other customer care you want to talk about? Going back to his, his statement about goals, um, before I was with Moxley Carmichael, I was at Ruby Tuesday. And we actually did, and I was responsible for social media at Ruby Tuesday. We chose not to launch a Twitter account um, because Ruby Tuesday has about 900 locations. Uh, there are millions of people that go through the stores every day. So a Twitter account, and, and not all of them are really always incredibly happy with their meal or, you know, things happen. Um, and so we decided, we said, we don't have the resources. It was just me. I can't staff a Twitter account when there are going to be a million people every day that could have a problem. Now, they won't all have a problem, but they're all gonna need some kind of resource from me, whether that's, where's a gluten-free menu? Um, how do I find a location near me? My, near, my location near me closed and I'm frustrated. Can I talk to somebody? Um, up to, I wanna talk to Sandy Bell because he's ruined my restaurant. You know, I mean, there's a million things that happen. Um, and the, the thing that happens on Twitter and Facebook, if you don't respond, people get, pretty frustrated. People go from being, hey, I just had a question, now they're disenfranchised. You, you take someone who's upset, and now they're no longer upset, now they're furious. And so they're telling five of their friends that I can't believe they didn't respond to me. Now, they're not, not helpful. Um, and so even if you have one, and you're not gonna be the scale of Ruby Tuesday or a Comcast, it's still really important from a c customer service perspective to respond quickly to people. Um, just respond, you know, and, and honestly, it's a bit ridiculous in terms of wait times. It's, you know, under an hour. You need to respond back. You know, so if I had tweeted the tomato head and said, what's today's special, even though the special has already been posted, um, and they don't respond to me an hour, am I gonna be more likely to go to tomato head or more likely to go someplace else? Well, now I'm frustrated. So I, I think there's a goal to say, if you're gonna set up this kind of platform, you need to be adequately prepared and staffed to handle it. So that would probably be my customer service warning just to add on to what Gavin was saying, um, in um, Utah, there is a lady named Heather Armstrong, and her handle is Deuce. And she started a blog back in the late 90s um, under that name, Deuce, Deuce.com. She was a graphic designer, and um, she's, she's very um, interesting. She has great opinions and she communicates very well. Um, she's slightly R-rated, but that, that's aside the point. But she was complaining about her work environment and it was basically an anonymous blog for a number of years and, um, and finally her boss figured out it was her and, and she got fired. So if you ever get fired for, being, for blogging, they call that being deuced. Um, so, so Deuce has gotten into, um, has built her, their, their whole family income off of her blog, off of her social media experience, off of Twitter. And about six months ago, she had ordered a washer and dryer set from Maytag. 
and had some problems with it. I'm not sure what that was, but she complained on Twitter about Maytag and how terrible this Maytag, these appliances were. And Maytag didn't respond. And I think it's really important what Gavin just said. Maytag didn't respond, but Bosch Appliances did respond and they gave her all new appliances in her whole house. Now, I'm not saying that that's gonna happen to anyone here, but, but the point, Deuce has a million, I'm sure she's at a million and a half followers now. And her influence is dramatic. Every blog post that she puts up, she gets over 100 comments on it. So as you think about these things, thinking about influence of the participants that are out there and people that are complaining about you is really important. Um, Mark Schaefer, a local blogger, wrote a whole post about the fact that restaurants are going to, at some point, want to know what the influence of the people are that are in their, in their restaurant at that time. And he had this idea that you, you could hold up your phone and kind of see, you know, where the influence, where the people are. But it's really important when you're engaging um, or thinking about engaging to know that there's people of influence out there that can dramatically damage your, your brand and damage your reputation. So that's one possible goal would be to, to preserve your customer service. The second being sales. Um, Dell has done a pretty good job of um, advertising specials that they have going on, um, communicating that, driving traffic into their website, and um, using it in that, in that sense. Um, another interesting case study is a car dealership. Um, if you think about the, the paradigm of what social media is, it's always called a conversation. If you think about the paradigm of car salesmen, I think that's the quintessential yelling in some way. You know, I mean, you can imagine that. And so to think about transforming that yelling, there's somebody had thrown up a um, fan page on Facebook and they had about 47 fans. They didn't have a Twitter account. And all of a sudden they said, we're really gonna pursue social media. We're gonna try to build on these networks of influence that are out there and drive more customers in our door but really build some relationships. And so what they started doing was things that if you're on Twitter or Facebook now, you might see offering promotions, contests, giveaways. They were giving away car washes at their dealership. They were giving away Apple gift cards, you know, a variety of things. And they grew their fan base a thousand percent. And they grew their, their Twitter account from nothing to 10,000 followers. And they started to engage the community. They started to have um, one of the things that they did giving back, they, they built a soldier um, give back where they, with, where they sent packages over to Afghanistan. And they did all of this through their social network. And now this was not a car dealership that was yelling at you about their greatest specials, but it was a network of people that were connected together through these, uh, these networks. They drove a number of sales through Facebook and through their fan page and they didn't have to shout at anyone. So I think that's a, a really interesting use. How many people in here have heard of Groupon, Living Social, right? Flutter Today, all these things, right? So the biggest benefit for a small business, uh, for those, any of those mechanisms, is the fact that you get a, a very large audience very quickly, right? So you, you actually pay a little bit um, in terms of what you're selling, um, but you can get a ton of people and a ton of traffic. Um, when you look at things like Dell Outlet, um, it doesn't have to, it works, Dell made you know, millions of dollars, because, but Dell s sunk a lot of money in the stuff they were selling. You, you could, you're not gonna create your own Groupon or Twitter Today or Living Social or Flutter Today, um, but what you, can, what you can do is you can start to communicate with your passion to fans um, about your specials. So you don't have to have a special, it's not all about promotions and coupons and um, essentially giving away the farm. That's not the goal of social media, um, but you can, uh, do that on your own and, and start to build a base so that when you do have a great special, um, you know, abode, um, uh, sadly closed. Um, but they use their blog and Twitter to say, hey, listen, this is the stuff that's left. Come get it. You know, because they're trying, to, they're trying to move. She's closing the store. She doesn't want stuff around. And so she can communicate with more people than could ever walk in the door. Um, and people anywhere could find it. You know, you may not live in Knoxville. You could live in Johnson City, but really want you know, that bench she had, and you can find it online and go buy it. So it, it's, a, it's another mechanism to communicate um, what you're looking for. From a nonprofit standpoint, donations um, are measured in some ways a lot like sales. And we work with a number of nonprofit clients, and 
whenever they talk about their website, they always want a giant donate now button on your website. And I always say, well, how much have you actually earned from that button? And it's usually less than $100 a year. Putting a donate now button just usually does not drive the traffic for, for people to donate. They know how to donate to this nonprofit. The, there was an interesting use of social media in Greenville, South Carolina with a battered women's um, nonprofit. And they created a viral video that was very well produced and it talked with a lot of the, the people that this nonprofit had helped. It spoke with a number of people in the community and how they relied on this nonprofit. It was a very touching video. It lasted about seven minutes long. The domain that it was on was it's just five bucks.com. And this proliferated through the through Twitter and through Facebook, and it was driving people in to say it's just five bucks. You know, that's that's all you have to give. At the end of the video, there's a button below that says donate five bucks through um, PayPal now. They raised over forty-five thousand dollars with that one campaign that they put out there. And that's not just a giant donate now button. It's, it's something with a very specific cause that they were able to use social media in a well thought way to achieve a goal and to really drive traffic and in some ways sales. Do you recognize, raise your hand if you recognize Old Spice guy. So, so this is a really great story about awareness. Old Spice before last year was like the worst Christmas present you could get. I mean, <laughs> it still might be, but um, the Old Spice commercial ran at the Super Bowl and then was completely out of sight for five months. And within a period of two days, 180 videos were produced, very specifically targeting influencers and speaking to them directly, trying to get them to engage with the Old Spice guy. And their, their Twitter followership, their Facebook followership went up 1,000%. Their sales, um, incidentally, went up 107%. Uh, but in, a commu in this, this realm of retail products where Axe had basically dominated, Old Spice showed up and was a body wash that was hip again because of the Old Spice guy. I think it's a great example and very recent example of how social media was used to drive this very viral. Um, so a lot of these videos, as I was looking through, had 6 million, 10 million, 12 million views. Um, and they produced 180, or put out 180. And they were doing them in real time, which I think is a huge feat. One of the things that Old Spice did is they set up the technology so that they targeted various celebrities, both real celebrities and then what I'd probably consider tech celebrities, like Kevin Rose, who's the CEO of Dig. Like most of you probably have never even used Dig, but he has a, millions of followers on Twitter, um, Alyssa Milano. And so they sent out a specific video to Alyssa Milano about a tweet she had sent out. So it was like a response, but it was him responding to Alyssa was like, hey, I hope you feel better, you know, see you around or something like that. But it was funny, but it was within like an hour of her tweet. Um, and so you've got this very large company choosing to respond. And so people like me are like, this is, how in the world are they doing that when in, in a world where TV production takes forever? I mean, commercials cost a lot of money and they take a long time to do them professionally. And here they are making them happen. You can use, I, I always like to tell this story about Motrin. Has anybody heard this story? Raise your hand if you have about. Um, uh, in 2008, in the fall of 2008, Motrin came out with a $30 million ad campaign where they talked about the pain that babies caused their mothers and how it seems to be in fashion. This campaign hit on a Thursday afternoon and that immediately started rage among a lot of mommy bloggers and mommy Twitterers. And um, by Sunday night, there was a nine minute video that was posted to YouTube that collected a lot of the outraged tweets of these mothers that said, how dare you tell us that it's in vogue to, to where are babies? How dare you to say that our babies cause us pain? And on Monday morning, there was a letter of apology from the vice president of marketing saying that basically that they had screwed up. And so the power of this network and what it can do um, to your brand is very important to realize when you're getting into it. 
it can also help you in, in crisis prevention. Um, uh, but, and there's a big argument among social media professionals that Motrin really could have embraced this and turned this around, but instead they pulled the plug. That could be debated for a long time. But um, I, you want to tell the Gary Vee story? Well, just, no, just about credibility and how social media can help build credibility through blogging and through Wine TV. Okay. Has anybody heard of Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk? Um, he started a, on YouTube, he started a t uh, regular show called Wine TV. And weekly, he would go through and taste wines. It's a New Jersey kid. He's of Polish descent. First, his parents were first generation and they owned a small liquor store. He's got a very thick accent. Um, he did not set a lot of props up, didn't have a great setup. In his office, he would set a webcam up and put this video up every week. If a secretary brought something in and handed it to him, they would do that in the middle of his webcast. He put this up every single week for, and he's still putting it up. I mean, he's been doing this for three years now. But um, out of this, he built this great influence that said wine, wine lovers don't have to be snobs. Wine lovers can be you and me and they can, they can love football. He has this big, he's a huge Giants fan, Jets fan, I'm sorry, and oops, and his goal is to buy the Jets. I mean that's his, and he has this giant spittoon with the Jets on it, so as he's tasting the, uh, the wine he'd spit into this. And, He's built this huge brand. He has over a million and a half Twitter followers now. Um, he has written a book called Crush It, which is a great book as you think about getting into to social media and the power of what you can do in building communities. But his biggest advice is to really focus on a niche and explore that, something that's, that you don't have a lot of competition in, and own it, and own it in every way that you can. Um, what he's done through this social network and through using YouTube and Twitter and a blog has grown the company. Um, their liquor store is now, they have five stores. Um, they have dramatically increased the visibility and he's established credibility in a community that wasn't even where he set out. He set out to, to focus on wine, but he's established credibility as a social media expert and travels all around the world um, doing speaking engagements. One of the big things about about him uh, came came uh, came from a story he was telling, and he and there are videos of him everywhere. So if you want to get a feel for him, uh, not all of them are going to. Well, he'll probably say, but a lot of them he uses a lot of profanity because um, he's really real. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so, but one of the things he said is, and this this struck me, is he said if we had a time machine and we brought the executives from Delta from 30 years ago to today and said, do you want to see what your customers are saying about you right now? And it costs $10 million, they would say, yes. And he would say, okay, great, well, it's free right here. So that's the kind of the power of what we're seeing with social media, uh, blogging, Twitter, Facebook, is the fact that t even 10 years ago, five years ago, you had no idea what your customers were saying about you. I can talk to Jeremy all day long about things, um, but when I, tweet him about things, everyone can see that. And so that's kind of the power that resides within market research. Um, yep, so, that, so even if you don't use it from a, a business perspective to say, okay, we really want to do a lot of broadcasting, we want to share what we know with the world, I definitely recommend at least sitting there and saying, okay, what are people saying? Are, a, are people saying things about us? B, if they are, um, let's make sure that we, we, we at least know that. But one of the biggest things I took away from Ruby Tuesday, Ruby Tuesday obviously has tons of tweets, right? There's just people talking about Ruby Tuesday all the time. Um, and it, you can learn a lot about what your customers think um, just from watching it. Now, if you don't have the volume, that's okay. You can still learn that, oh, they're interested in this type of food, or oh, they're interested in this type of service that we don't currently offer, or oh, everyone that comes in here is really negative because we have someone up front who's not very happy. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the answer is. You can learn a lot about your customers. So, back to market research. And, that, and that's really it. I mean, I really think that what you can, what social media allows you to do is set a lens on whatever it is that you're trying to figure out at that time, and you can figure out what people are saying about your brand. You can test things before you even take them to market. 
um, and, and the power of that through the blogging community. There's the, the power um, in, in the mommy blogger community to test products before you take anything out, before you develop anything, um, and for very low cost, you can use this focus group out there. Um, we're going to go into the other questions. That first one was, what are your goals? And those were the, the six areas that I think um, you can really use social media. Do you have any others? Blogging can be really important for thought leadership. Um, so one of, the, one of the areas Jeremy mentioned is kind of tough to manage is, is medical, right? So we have a number of medical clients. Um, one of them is, is gastrointestinal associates, um, and they do colonoscopies for the most part. So not necessarily the sexiest thing in the world, but do you know what people search for more than anything else? Medical information, right? So, and what do people, they certainly search about colonoscopies. They have all kinds of questions about that and other, you know, illnesses and diseases and, and things that have to do with the GI tract. And so one of the things that we've done with um, Dr. Overholt and, and the rest of the staff is we work with them to create a blog to say, let's be, you guys can be thought leaders. You already are. You already write for um, some of the top medical journals in the United States. Why don't you, why don't you do this on your own? And then as people who are looking for that type of information, they can find it. And so we've got blog titles like Diver, Diverta What, which is about diverticulosis. I'm not even sure what it is necessarily, but it is a disease, a disease or an illness that probably has something to do with your, your, your GI tract. And so, but when you, when, when you wanna learn about those things, you're gonna hit the internet first. And so that drives people to Dr. O's website, from Dr. Overholt's website, he, they then turn into leads and they come in and they say, hey, you know, and, and sure, and we're still, they're still tracking, right? We still have to figure that part out across the board. Um, how do you make sure that you, what you're doing on the outset, kind of Jeremy's points about the time, the money, how are those turning into to sales or whatever your metric is? Um, but he's, he's a thought leadership in this area um, and, and the rest of his staff and the rest of the guys that work there uh, and, and women too, of course, um, are really starting to um, kind of own that space. And so that's a great way for all of you. Everyone here has a specific mission for your organization. Um, you, you don't have to blog every day, but you, you could certainly blog once a month, once every other week about something that's important to you, about your industry, about um, about Knoxville, um, about something that you want to sell. It doesn't really matter. So We're going to get into in just a second after I, uh, I'll be much quicker to get through these other questions. But um, as we look at some different networks out there and in ways that you can engage, um, are you going to use a blog? Are you going to use YouTube? Um, Blendomatic uh, is a very high priced blender. Um, and they started a YouTube channel called Will It Blend? And they took things like iPhones and iPods, and they even did an iPad, and just to, to put it into their um, blender to see whether it will blend. Well, what do you learn in that? That this is a basically indestructible blender that they're selling and the quality of it. They chose to exclusively focus on their, uh, on their YouTube channel. They have a blog that supports it, but you know, really it's the video that does everything. I think blogs are, they're a foundational element and as we get into that and talk about that, I think that it's really important. But it's building that influence out there. In your business, is that important to have people that follow you, that respect you, that think that you're the thought leader, where you have credibility. Those are really important, and that's usually achieved through, through a blog, and there's, there's two ways that that happens. One, through consistent readership, where people read everything that you post. Every time you post something, they read what you're doing. Um, we have a local blog celebrity, Mark Schaefer, who has uh, one of the biggest blog readership that I'm aware of in Knoxville. Every post that he puts out gets 90 to 100 comments on it. Um, he has over 18,000 uh, Twitter followers out there. His influence is amazing. When he says something, a lot of people listen. Um, and, and I think that's a great foundation. And for Mark, that was how he built his basis, was through his blog, and then moved into some of the other social networks. Obviously, knowing who your customers are, if you're doing any marketing at all, you know the answer to this. But the other part of that is, so your customers are out there, do they even want to engage with you online? And I think that's a really important consideration um, to make. Are they, if, if it is a, a lot of medical situations, um, they are in an intake mode. 
They want to do research in the privacy of their computer. They don't really want to engage in forums and talk about all of their personal ailments. And so what are you doing in that situation? How are you actually handling that? Where are your customers? Um, are they participating in blogs? Are they in forums? Are, are your customers um, more inclined to, to look at videos? Um, and so, you know, it's very important to establish some research on that and kind of know where, where your customers are at. And then this kind of completes the loop of questions, which is how will you know success when you get there? And that goes back to the first question, which was what were your goals? So once you've established your goals and I want to increase my Facebook fans from, from 100 to, to 1,000, and because I know that if they see my daily promotions, they're going to want to buy my product. I want to increase my blog readership from seven a day to 70. I want to, you know, whatever those metrics are, and then to be able to say, yes, we're achieving that. And sometimes it's, it's easy to look at numbers like that. Sometimes you have to take more of a macro approach and just look, did, did revenue go up? Did I increase sales? Um, and, and so there's a lot of debate. The, this will, in 2011, start to really work out. Um, 2010 was supposed to be the year of measurement and a lot of advancement was made to really try and draw lines between investment of time in Twitter and what that led to in revenue. They're really starting to draw those, bring those two together in some ways and I think we'll see a big improvement on that. People think social media is free. I'm ready to jump in. I want to be on Twitter. I want to be on Facebook. I want to see all the, the results. I hear about Facebook passing 500 million on the news. This is a great place to be. But really, I, I, I think it's about the, um, the process behind it and what, what you're planning to do in establishing that on the front end. And so I, I want to think about the inside out approach. The inside is the most important part of social media. Having an evangelist and an ambassador in an organization that believes that social media is the place to be, that believes they're going to get results, and that can communicate that effectively to the entire organization is the single most important thing that you can have in a social media plan. If you ha and it has to be someone at the top, someone that people listen to, and they have to be the ambassador for it. Otherwise, there's this investment of time. You start to spend a lot of time on it, and people go, what do you why are you on that blog all day? Why are you spending so much time on Twitter? And then I think building the policy and the process behind it. How are you going to respond to a negative complaint about your brand? Are you going to pull the plug entirely? Um, I think of a, uh, locally, um, we had an issue with jewelry television a while back where a claim was made about a specific gem and what um, the, the scarcity of that gem. They had a blog and a community of people united on that blog in protest to, to jewelry television, the response was to pull the plug on the blog. Instead of being able to work through that crisis, you know, and, and try to change the, the minds of their customers, to reach out back to the point of customer service and really be there for their customers. Um, training is really important. Having people know how to participate. There's great tools available in social media and knowing which tools to use, which are going to you know, help you out the most is very important. And then identifying the staff that's going to participate, really making that allocation at the outset. A lot of people expect the participation to happen. And you know, we're going to engage in social media, but we haven't really identified those that are going to be our brand ambassadors to the public. And so I think all of these things are, are very important. Would you add anything on the inside? I want to add one thing to training. Um, I would actually probably say one of the, I think Jeremy's right, evangelism is very important. You need an advocate that's, that's near the top um, that's pushing for this um, because otherwise the resources won't get allocated. It doesn't matter if you're a two-person business or you're uh, a, a mega business. It, it, it just won't happen. But I would actually probably say the, the place where most people m put the least amount of time is probably in training. And what training means is, is, is not necessarily saying, this is how you tweet. It's, it's often about saying, and it ties back to policy, these are the things that are okay, and these are the things that aren't okay. So with 500 million people on Facebook, um, probably every single employee you have has a Facebook account. But what they probably don't know is what it's okay to talk about and what's not okay to talk about. Um, and they're going to talk about those things on both sides of it. Um, and so you have to go back and say, 
okay, this is not okay. This is not public record. Facebook is not a private place for you to share anything about our clients or anything about us. There's a, there's a number of stories where employees have been fired for things they've said. Um, and a lot of times they're younger. You know, there's a, um, a employee who posted about not doing anything at work and she hated her boss. Well, he replied and said, yeah, well, don't come in tomorrow. You know, and that was it. Um, it, it goes both ways. I mean, and, and, and there's, I mean, you, we can find screenshots of that. It, it really happened. Um, or there's a, a place out in California um, where a lot of celebrities ate. It was like a little bistro. Well, one of the employees started tweeting about the celebrities who came in. Yeah, XYZ came in today. He didn't look so great. Yeah, you know, she came in today, had this. That really surprised me. That kind of a thing. Well, the business itself was built off of being a, really a place where these celebrities could go and not necessarily be a celebrity. Well, and, and once they found out, that company actually got sued um, because of the things that were being said about um, the celebrities that were coming in because they were not happy. And so all it, all it would have taken was that owner to say, hey, here's the deal. Part of our brand is that we are, we are the sanctuary for the celebrities that come in here. We don't talk about them. You might be able to say, hey, we had some celebrities come by today, but not XYZ looked horrible or whatever the tweet is. And so, and it doesn't have to be a bit, it doesn't have to be restaurant. It could be any kind of food. It could be general rule of thumb. Don't talk bad about your clients online. You know, they pay us to do work, not to give our opinion on what we think about their responses. Um, and, and that's all it takes. But most businesses really forget to do that until a crisis happens, until someone says something that they should not have said. And now you're both, you're doing recovery of that client or that customer or whoever it is, as well as it's fully public. Anybody can find it. So I would say make sure, make sure if you're going to go here, evangelize, advocate, but really make sure you get a policy and training in place um, that are tandem. Because a lot of times it's not even going to be things that are public. It might just be on Facebook might just be between me and Jeremy and our five friends on Facebook because, well, that's dumb, but, you know, but we need to be told. Well, and, and to take that and think about, um, I, I put strategy at the top of the outside and, and what's going, you know, what the participation looks like. These are the things we're familiar with, you know, the strategy, what are we going to do, how are we going to engage, the in real life networking. Um, the, the tools that we're going to use, the platforms we're going to be in, those are, those are the most common things that, we're, that you probably came in here to, to think about and to talk about. The problem is right now and, and over the last year, people hired social media managers to come in and they wanted them to do strategy and they wanted them to get their businesses on the right course. They wanted to set the policy. They wanted to do all these things with that one person. Oh, and by the way, they also want them to be the staff. And what we're realizing is, and, and, and Gavin alluded to it earlier, you come in to do strategy at a restaurant chain and all of a sudden you need to be the help desk for um, 500 restaurants or, or whatever the case is. And those are, are not compatible. And I heard an interesting quote this week that said, as people are looking forward and kind of making their prediction, they said, what do you call, uh, recruiting is obviously, uh, a very big area of social networking and using LinkedIn and using um, some of these networks to figure out um, who you're going to hire. So what do you call a social media recruiter in 2015? A recruiter. I mean, and we're going to drop all these titles off of it. It's not going to be around this social media. It's just going to become part of everything that we do and an expectation that that's just like email, Twitter, LinkedIn will all become part of our, our routine. So. I think it's important to kind of separate those and think about, more importantly, how am I going to support this process um, rather than just getting the fix in place and thinking about what my strategy is going to be. So we'll jump into some tools um, real quick. The basis of any engagement is really to listen and, and kind of jump into these things. Um, you mentioned Google Alerts. Is everybody in here, raise your hand if you're familiar with Google Alerts. So you can go to alerts.google.com, and if you have a Gmail address, um, they may have even opened it up to, to all email addresses now, you can enter a real-time alert on anything that you want to know about. So I have an alert on my name anytime that I get mentioned in anything, just so that I know what, pe what bad stuff Kevin's saying about me. Um, within minutes of Google becoming aware of content, it emails you and says, um, 
includes the excerpt that Google found and a link to the article, so you can go out and see that. Um, that's a great way to listen to your own brand, to listen to your competitors, what are, what's going on with your, with your competitors. It is one of the best tools um, out there. There's, there are a number of tools. Um, Social Mention is a similar free tool um, that you can use, and it really looks to Twitter, Facebook, anything that's public on Facebook, and in blogs. Um, but it's more particularized to these social organizations than Google. But Google is such a, a beast. Um, I, you know, they, they do a very comprehensive search. I've never received an alert from social mention that Google didn't pick up. So would you agree with that? Um, to understand a little bit about Facebook, you probably know this, there's all this talk of their privacy policy always. Um, more than likely, if someone writes in their status update about your brand, you're probably not going to see that unless they're your friend on Facebook or, or something like that, because generally status updates are blocked. You can publish everything, um, and some people do, but more than likely you're going to um, pick up anything that's said about you on Twitter, on blogs, um, this new Quora thing that we'll talk about. But it's, it's different assets that are not behind some sort of privacy protection. Social Mention is a great place to go if you want to get a report sent to you. If you're wondering about like a really real-time update right now, search.twitter.com is really a great place to go for that because you can, that was search.twitter.com. And it basically it looks like Google except it's a Twitter link. Um, but the, under their advanced search, you can say, I want it in this language. I want the, sent the sentiment, basically, is it happy, sad, or neutral um, or angry? The others, I would just say as far as listening, um, were Radian 6 and Scout Labs um, are two paid searches that you, can, uh, that you can have. They allow far more of what they're calling social CRM, um, where for customer service, I'm not sure which one Comcast is using, but they're using, uh, I think they're using Radian 6, but it allows the company to track all of the engagements. And so inside of this interface, inside of Radian 6, um, you get all of the information, the tweets that are out there. You can log in and actually tweet from inside that interface. Those tools are usually for very big brands. They're very expensive. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 a month to start and then kind of goes up from there depending upon the keywords that you search on. So by and large, I think a lot of the free tools cover the needs. If you have a social media department where you have multiple people engaging um, and you have to know immediately what's being said about your brand, it's something to consider to go with Scout Labs or, or Radiant 6. Um, so this is the, a map that was uh, rendered last year based upon the, uh, the number of users um, that are in all of these social networks. There's also this graphic that's pretty nice. Um, this giant, um, circle sphere is the number of mobile devices that are used globally and then sort of stair stepping down um, <coughs> from Skype, Facebook, the email providers, um, some interesting Twitters in here at 114 million, um, Foursquare, BrightKite and GoWall are location based services that we'll talk about in a second. Um, they have pretty small, uh, pretty small communities right now but, they're, but they are growing. So I'm going to just run through these. If you have any questions about any of these platforms as I'm in them, just throw a hand up and, and we'll, we'll get into that. Um, blogging, some of the big blog engines that you might or might not be familiar with is WordPress, Blogger, TypePad. Those, you can actually go to any of those websites. Um, and I would add two more, um, Posterous and Tumblr, um, make it very easy to set up a blog. But I'm pretty sure people know what blogs are now, um, but the idea is it's a very easy publication platform. You can set a blog up, you can pick a theme that looks like you like, and um, start publishing right away. Uh, all of the information is stored on a database on the back end, and it can be exchanged in a number of different ways. That's what makes blogs great, because people can subscribe to what they call RSS feeds, really simple syndication feeds and they can receive updates on blogs just like emails in their inbox. And that's 
part of the reason that blogs have grown so much, they're also extremely search engine friendly. And um, so we were talking earlier about blogs and sort of how people build this influence and followership out there. Um, there's really two ways that that happens. Um, through that networking, you get to know someone, you want to read their blog, every time they post you read what they write. I think more commonly, um, people find things through search engines. They're looking for information and the way that blogs are organized are written specifically to search engines. Um, search engines love the way that they're organized with all of the coding on the back end. So um, blogging is a great way to build expertise. Like Gavin was talking about in medical or um, in business to business and marketing. I mean, any area, there are very few areas I could think that you would not benefit from a blog um, to really explore a niche and what your expertise is. Um, yep. Um, a great example of that is actually someone who's doing the last session, Susie Trotta. Um, and she's a local realtor. Her blog is all around ktown.com. And it's all, and she's a great example of how to do a blog because she's not, her end goal is ultimately sales, right? She wants to sell more houses um, for more people, but she doesn't do that from her blog. All she does is showcase how much she knows about Knoxville on her blog and house prices and people and shows she's a relational. She has, she's a good writer, but she has a very approachable tone. Um, and what she doesn't do is the car salesman. She doesn't say, I have these four houses that you should buy right now because they're awesome. She says, here's a neighborhood. I don't have any houses in the neighborhood, but these are some, here are the top buys in my opinion. I uh, hear the top foreclosures in Knoxville this week. Um, she's providing a resource, which ultimately leads people to buy houses through her. I've bought, well, I'm buying a house through her, um, but she knows a lot about the local communities, like all realtors do, but instead of hiding that knowledge inside their head and only sharing it with the people that actually work with them, she shares it for everybody. And if you Googled, I'm, I, I'll take a chance. I said, it, if you Googled River Mist or um, River Sound, Knoxville, I bet she's going to have a review on it and talk about the median house price and have some pictures. And so when people move here or looking to move internally, it's a great place. And anybody can do that. You could be an accountant. You can be a lawyer. You can be, doesn't, it doesn't have to be professional service. Anybody can do it. And I know Susie will cover this. I think the key with blogging and to get that level of search engine optimization of influence with your network is to really tailor all of the content that's written around one topic area and you become an expert. And there are a number of great success stories of how blogs have um, grown people's businesses. As I mentioned Deuce earlier. Um, Deuce has a very, very nice income. Um, she doesn't work other than her blog and her husband doesn't work and they have a very nice house, all from their income from their blog. So um, there are a number of people that have built their whole lives um, using their blog. Um, enough on that. Um, Twitter, talked a lot about Twitter. It's, it's my favorite. I really enjoy Twitter. Um, it's an easy way to communicate. It strips down a lot of the complexity that you have in some other social networks, Facebook. Um, there's not, currently, there's not a picture mechanism built into Twitter, although that may change. Um, it's basically just messages. And they're limited to 140 characters. And you can um, communicate. We saw earlier um, all of the names have the at sign in front of them. Um, and that's called a mention in Twitter. And um, that alerts, if I were to write at Gavin Baker, it would alert him that I had just written a tweet about him and we can carry on a conversation much like uh, instant messaging or, or texting. Um, it continues to grow. There's 120 million accounts. There's 10 to 12 million users. So everybody has 10 accounts. Gavin has 20. Um, but, you know, a number of people you have a few people that are writing most of the tweets. Um, as, as with blogs, 20% of the, the bloggers write 80% of the content. So um, this, we talked about listening earlier. This gives you the greatest opportunity to eavesdrop and to know what people are saying about you, about your brand, about your competitors, um, because most of the accounts are public. So. Um, that makes it uh, a, a really good platform to just get sentiment and know what people are thinking about a brand. Um, Facebook, everybody raised their hand on Facebook. Um, almost everybody, I think. Um, 500 million users, 
Um, there's some predictions when they're going to pass uh, a billion users. Um, they are, they're growing. It's a, it's the social network um, that it has the greatest force. Some interesting stats and why it is so uh, important. There's a billion interactions a day, status updates, pictures uploaded, you know, comments or whatever. That's that's an astounding number, um, and half of the users are on there every day, and that half spends an average of 55 minutes on there. That's the highest participation on any site. Um, we'll look at YouTube in a minute, I think it's 16 minutes. So it's astounding how much time people are farming virtual crops on Facebook. It blows me away. <laughs> um, of that, there's 200 million mobile users. Um, a lot of the participants in Facebook don't even have a computer. They do everything through their phone. And I think that's pretty incredible. And that's a good segue to this slide in that phones, in some ways, transform all of this stuff. Um, Glenn Reynolds over at UT Law School calls them pocket cannons. Um, you can pound anything out to any part of the world with this little device that's basically a television studio, a radio studio, a two newspaper, all of those things built into one little smartphone. And when you think to the terrorist attacks in Mumbai, it, um, Twitter was one of the forces that was inside the hotel. Uh, people were tweeting what was going on inside. Um, in uh, the Iran elections, the f Twitter was one of the things that was allowing the world to know what was going on inside. And um, but people are doing that through their, through their cell phones and uploading the video and uploading um, information to Twitter from, these, from their phones. It's really important to pay attention to what's going on with mobile. Um, through text messaging, um, 25 million texts a day in the U.S. Um, it's, it's very important. LinkedIn, everybody's pretty much familiar with it. Um, a lot of people have an account. They're dormant. Um, some people actively use LinkedIn. There is a number of groups that are very powerful within LinkedIn. And as you work on a topic area into a niche, it's really great to pursue those groups. And then they have question and answer sessions inside of LinkedIn. And it's a great way to build your reputation up there. Um, if you're an attorney with a very specific practice area, um, you can use LinkedIn to grow your expertise, to build your referral base. Um, if you're in business consulting, it's a great way for people to find out your knowledge. That's what they're hiring you for. And so using the question and answer, I, I think the, has the greatest results that I've seen with LinkedIn. It's also a great recruiting tool. Um, Location-based services really made a, a big hit last year, um, and Foursquare and, and, and GoWalla really were in contention for the top spot. Um, then Foursquare um, received $175 million, and that kind of boosted them up. But basically the idea is I can go to any location and with my phone tell my friends and my network where I am. I can broadcast that to Facebook, I can broadcast that to Twitter. Um, and Foursquare has a gaming component to it. I can compete with my friends. The more check-ins I perform in a week, the higher my score is. Um, but it's really become this tool that people can let their friends know where they are. And I, you know, the gaming component's a part of it, but I really think it's just about broadcast and notification sort of a status update world where we tell people what we're doing all the time. Um, Foursquare has a great business opportunity because you can offer um, coupons through it. You can offer coupons to um, adjacent, if I'm checking in at, at one restaurant and 500 yards away, um, I'm offering a special. When I'm checking in at the restaurant, it'll say, hey, there's a special nearby. You might want to go over there and check it out. So. Locate, this is the very primitive form of where I think we're going with location-based um, technology. We'll probably end up in something that looks a lot more like an opt-in. And as I'm driving down the road, I'll be notified of deals and coupons. And instead of having billboards as advertisements, it'll come through my mobile phone. But that's down the road. Facebook um, has their own location-based service called Places. And you know, here again, it's just a 
um, way to notify your friends that you're at a bar and you, you'd like them to come join you. Any comments there, Mr. Baker? YouTube, um, YouTube and Google are always in competition for who is the top search um, at any given time. There's two billion views a day on, on YouTube. Um, like I said earlier, about 15, 15 minutes a day on, uh, on YouTube looking at videos. I think this was just a really cool stat that there's more video uploaded in 60 days than networks created in 60 years. I think that's uh, astounding, the amount of video that they store. And just real quick, um, I talked about Flickr earlier. Flickr is a great social network to share pictures. Um, what you can also do with Flickr from a commercial standpoint and from a business standpoint, a real estate agent can put their walkthrough of a house on Flickr and then put the address on there and that becomes a searchable item. Um, a retailer can put all of their um, goods on there. A jeweler could take and put all of the aspects of their jewelry on Flickr into a set and that becomes searchable and you can start to build a network within that community. Um, Scribed is is more like a static blog in a way. Um, Scribe, you can take white papers and information that you've written um, in long form in a PDF and upload that into, into Scribe. All of that information becomes indexed and it's a real authority for, for expertise and knowledge. Uh, I really like Scribe. I think it's a great way to take a lot of content that you've already written, you already have in some Word doc or in some form put that in described and, um, and start to get some of your information indexed. And I put Quora up here, it's a brand new, it, it's a relatively new social network. It's been around for about a year and a half. It went public last June, but the usage spiked dramatically in December. And um, what's really neat about this site, a lot of the, um, it, it's so early that a lot of the people that are on this, it's a question and answer site and a lot of the um, people that were decision makers, that were movers and shakers in the internet world are on there and they're answering questions. So you can ask a, a question to Dustin Moskovitz and he comes in and answers it or um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is on there. And a lot of these guys that have developed tools that have gone through startup, that have gone through business are on there and they're writing to you and they're very accessible. It reminds me a lot of like how Twitter was a few years ago. So. I think it's a really interesting tool to check out. So, and with that, I'm, I'm done. <laughs>